And mobile health, this is a great topic. As you, I did a t uh, research in the late 90s, actually, on uh, mobile, he mobile health, the impact of um, wireless in healthcare. And back then, um, actually, Hippocrates was one of the companies I did study. And back then, it was all about Palm Pilot. Maybe it was even called US Robotics at that point. But, and it is interesting how it's been evolving. So I'm really looking forward to the event tonight. And you know, Stanford you know, Medical School just handed out um, iPads to all the new incoming students this year. So. Um, and today, tonight's event will be led by, moderated by Dr. Chris Weston. He is the Managing Director of Strategy Innovation of Health Industry Advisor at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And he's one of the writers of the white paper that you received tonight. He is, um, not only he's interested in mobile health, but he is a sports person. He is doing an escape from New York, which is 62 kilo bike ride in New York City. And in two weeks later, he'll be doing a triathlon race. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he is really enjoying the mobile health. And he's liking the fact that he can try out all these different cool apps. And one of the things he do like is called Wireless Scale, which talks to your scale and it monitor, it gives you your performance, how much you are losing and stuff. So it's really interesting. And he thinks the, the reason it's so interesting, not only to him but to many people, is because it is such a personal technology that the, even the patients and doctors and you know, people do understand and can use, not like something, some other stuff. So please join me welcoming Dr. Chris Weston. It's always fun to be back in California. I grew up in California in a little Danish town called Solvang. The, those of you that know Solvang think of it like Disneyland. You don't think that people really live there, but actually I'm proof that I live there. This last summer, I actually took my children there. My children are all a bit older now, but they wanted to see where dad grew up. So we drove in the San Inez Valley from Los Angeles you know, over the mountains, and we go to the high school and it's not changed at all, except they painted it since I graduated 30 some odd years ago. But uh, my kids were so surprised, having grown up in New York City metro area in Houston, Texas, that their dad came from such a podunk little town. And there's the same 2,000 people live in Solving today that there were when I lived there 30 years ago. So it's fun to come back to California and to enjoy the, the weather and the beauty of this state. Two weeks ago, we launched the M Health paper that you have there, Healthcare Unwired. And I did this in San Diego, actually, as part of my anniversary. So I stayed at the Del Coronado with my wife for a few days, and then we launched the paper a, a day or so later. And when I got up there, um, I recalled that 10 years before, I was in San Diego giving a presentation on how to create a digital marketplace. Do you remember what those things are? They're all kind of gone now. Uh, but there was a lot of hype 10 years ago about digital marketplaces and how they were going to transform commerce and and I actually was the CEO of a startup digital marketplace, and I had been asked to go speak about the toolkit to create a digital marketplace. And I had an epiphany at that time. And the epiphany was that all this internet activity that we were doing at that time was actually creating things that would generate very little incremental value. That is, these digital marketplaces would create pennies of value per transaction and couldn't justify the multi-billion dollar valuations that they had. We were really creating this kind of simple utility. And the other part of the epiphany was that all of this internet technology that we were bringing to the market through these startup companies and others was actually not going to create very many large, valuable companies, but was going to become ubiquitous in that every single company was going to be leveraging this technology and incorporate it into what they do. So last week or two weeks ago when I was in San Diego, my message around that was dealing with some of the blogs right now they are talking about mobile health being hype. And as the mobile health that we're talking about now and all the hype that we see on the internet discussion uh, blogs about this, suggesting that it's really a passing fad and will go away. And while there might be a lot of hype, part of the message in our report is that mobile health is going to become ubiquitous in healthcare just like the internet is ubiquitous in every part of business. 
that you won't be able to actually have any health care, whether personally provided yourself or by provided by your clinician, that will not have a mobile health component to it. Now, the challenge that we have as we move into this new world of mobile health is trying to figure out where and we focus and how we actually create value for mobile health. And what we've noticed, I've done a lot of consulting with one of the industry standard groups that are setting the standards for mobile health technology. They're called the Continua Health Alliance. And they've been very disappointed at the uptake in these technologies, on the consumer side particularly, because they provide these certification standards and they're not finding as many devices becoming certified. And part of what I've identified has been part of the challenge is that when we talk about mobile health, there is this immediate jump to thinking that we've got to have it integrated with the physician. And the reality is that the standard that a physician has for adoption of any technology is very, very high. They want to see double-blinded studies. They want to see five years of clinical data. They want to have insurance reimbursing it, or they won't touch it with a barge pole. And so when you have these very high standards, the adoption of a new technology is going to be fairly slow. I mean, look at Look at the traction we've had with the iPhone, and I'm an iPhone user, I'm not an Android user, but you, know, you can think of Android when I say iPhone if you hate Apple. So. But, but think of the rapid adoption we've had just in a couple years with these iPhone apps. Okay? You can't have that sort of thing in a clinical environment because the FDA gets involved and you've got to have uh, the, the physicians have to be satisfied that it's got the, the veracity to it. And so as we look at the, the commercialization of these technologies, we need to think about whether or not the opportunity we're focused on is a consumer opportunity, which has a lower standard, faster to market, whether it's a clinical opportunity or whether it's an infrastructure opportunity. And as we think about that, we've not got to think very clearly about what our business models are. So you'll notice on our report, the subtitle is about business models. Because what we identified in all the research that was being done on mobile health you had everybody rushing out to say how big the market was. But no one was really addressing the issue that's stopping the market from becoming big in the first place, which was the lack of business models that would help people figure out where and how to make money and get the traction they need for this market to really explode. So as we think about business models, we think about these three different segments of models. And yes, it would be nice if they all integrated and interoperated, but eventually, that's probably not going to happen. And so you'll see in our case studies that some of the case studies that we have are very consumer-oriented. And in fact, one of the companies that we interviewed uh, was a company spun out of, of Harvard Medical School because they were trying to sell a consumer solution that consumers wouldn't buy unless their insurance company was going to pay for it. Because when a consumer goes to a hospital, they're no longer a consumer. They're a patient. And when they're a patient, they no longer pay for things themselves. Insurance does. So if you actually want to get a consumer solution sold, you have to do what Harvard did. You have to spin the company out of a clinical environment and turn it into a separate, unaffiliated organization that's going to sell directly to consumers. Because when you sell directly to consumers, even if it's a healthcare wellness type solution, they'll pay for it. They have the money. They'll do it. But not if they have the expectation that their insurance company is going to pay for it. So you've got to start to think about how you tease these business models apart so you can get traction and adoption. One last thing that I'll mention, and then we'll, we'll go into our, our discussion here with uh, our panelists and our presenting company, is I, as you heard, I you know, try to exercise, try to be healthy. I, I love gadgets. You know, I just got my Garmin GPS heart rate monitor device. It's the coolest. It's, it's kind of small. I mean, as small as Garmin can make things, which isn't small enough, but, but it's smaller. Um, and so I'm able to gather all this information. So I love gathering all this data, plotting my runs, and integrating it into my different apps that keep track of my eating habits and my other activity. But the problem is that an app that takes information that I give it and does nothing more than give it back to me is a pretty crappy app, OK? So I mean, I'm glad that it can show me this information. I'm glad that it's storing it. So as mentioned earlier, this, this Y thing scale that I have, it's the coolest. I love it. Everybody needs to have a wireless scale. But the thing that I love about it is, again, it's, it's tracking information over, over time. And so I can actually see my weight and my wife's weight, okay? 
because I can actually toggle to see what she's doing as well, all right? So, so I've lost 20 pounds in the last five months, and so that's why there's a negative slope on that line, all right? So, so this is a pretty cool app. But the problem is it only tells me one thing. It tells me my weight. I mean, it tells me my lean mass, my fat mass, my BMI, but it really tells me my weight. What I'd like to do, though, is if I'm going to take the effort to give it my weight, and if I'm going to take the effort to give another app my nutritional information, and another app my exercise information, and another app other information that I provide it, I want some intelligence to come back and say, you know, Chris, you're not eating enough protein. Your muscle mass is not growing commensurate with your exercise because your diet's not matching, all right? So change your eating habits. I wanted to tell me that, Chris, you've got a goal to run a triathlon in two weeks. You're overtraining. You need to have more rest days involved in that. Okay? I want the same intelligence from my app that I get from my, my trainer, my coach, or, or my physician, or something like that. So the problem we have right now is we have these dumb apps. And they're almost all dumb apps. Now, they're the first apps, and they'll get better, I'm sure. But when you look at what I think really needs to take place in order to turn mobile health into a real uh, useful tool that will become ubiquitous, will actually transform the medicine and wellness community, it needs to do four things. It needs to be integrated. I need to have apps that can actually integrate multiple devices, multiple data, and bring it to me in one app that integrates all this information. It needs to have interoperability. So that, I can, so that I don't have these silos where I have to have an app for my scale, which is separate than my app for my Garmin, which is separate than my app for my uh, other activities. Then I want intelligence. I wanted to take all this information and tell me something I don't already know, okay? or that I couldn't already see if I printed out a, a sheet. And then the last thing, which gets to this issue about the, the scale and I can see my wife's weight, well, I actually have this other app called Lose It, which is, I, I love it. I've tried like a half a dozen of these nutritional tracking things. Lose It's the coolest so far. But uh, it's actually social. So I can actually see what my daughter's doing, what, what my wife is doing, and we can actually set up routines. So I, uh, I pole vaulted in high school. My daughter's pole vaulting in high school. She decided that we need to train together so we can pole vault together, all right? <laughs> so, so actually, I'm training right now to do the master's version of pole vaulting for the next two years while she's in high school. So, so we're training together. Well, I want to be able to see what she's doing in her training, as well as her weight and these other things, because I'm her coach for these things. So I want this socialization element so I can have a community of support now that when I add the information that's integrated, when I add the intelligence from a, a, a device, and then I can add the social element, all of a sudden now we can change behavior. And while we change behavior, that's how we actually improve health. Because we know that two-thirds, or we know that 75% of all the healthcare costs come from 25% of the people, and 75% of the healthcare costs from five diseases. And so if we can focus on those 25% of the people that have these five diseases, we can actually eliminate most of the costs in healthcare. The problem is that to do that, we have to change behavior. And the only way we change behavior is through social activity. And the technology provides the tools to really complement and enhance that social activity. All right? So that's the challenge that I have for the mobile health community. I think that's where they really need to focus. That's where you're going to create value in this. And that's where you're going to transform healthcare and wellness in the world. So with that, what I'd like to do next is I'd like to introduce our four members of our panel. Uh, by name and their company, but then I'd like them to give a very brief one-minute summary of why they're here, okay? And they may not know, but I hopefully they, they know why they're here. So, so they'll give us that, and then after that, we're going to invite Wilson to come up and tell us about his company. So Wilson, you want to go first? Sure. Um, so my name is Wilson Toe, um, and I'm part of Mobile Life. Uh, I'm a graduate student over at UC Davis, um, but the reason why I'm here is really to explore um, mobile technologies because we did uh, do a recent technology competition, the Imagine Cup competition, and we ended up winning the uh, first place prize nationally. And so we want to expand technology and really push it further and see how we can incorporate it both domestically and internationally. So that's a little bit about why I'm here. Thanks. Anand. Uh, Anand Iyer, President Chief Operating Officer of WellDoc. Um, <laughs> by way of background, I'm a type 2 diabetes patient and I came from 
20 years of consulting in the wireless industry, so I joke that uh, the two things that define my DNA, one is good, wireless in my blood, one is bad, too much sugar in my blood, and here we are. Well, Doc, um, we started the company, myself, an endocrinologist, and her brother, who's a finance and insurance guy, uh, with the hope of improving outcomes and reducing costs for diabetes patients. I would say everything you said, Chris, is spot on, except you, I think you forgot the most important thing, which is outcomes. Ah, At the end of the day, sure. if it doesn't generate outcomes, I don't care how interoperable or how integrated or blah, blah, blah it is, if it doesn't generate outcomes, nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to pay for it. And, and, and so I think what WellDoc is, is a system that incorporates a lot of the elements that you said, because on this garbage phone, I don't have an iPhone, I actually have an iPhone, that's my other phone, <laughs> but on this garbage, this garbage phone that they don't make anymore, I have uh, my meal management, I have my diabetes management, I have my asthma management, I have everything in one single place. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're showing a $1,350 per patient per year cost savings to the health system in the Blues Plan. We're showing a two-point A1C reduction. For those of you who know what A1C is, it's a target of seven in diabetes. Every, every one point delta, seven to eight, eight to nine, is a 42% increase in the risk of heart attack, stroke. The FDA heralds a drug if it drops A1C by half a point. We dropped A1C by two points in our clinical trials. It, all of a sudden, wow, what did you guys do, right? Tectonic, bad word to use in the West Coast. Tectonic <laughs> shockwave, right? The, 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 the reality is here's something that's configurable. It fits on any cell phone. It fits into clinical workflow and patients' lives. It's configurable, but it has all the elements that I think you mm -hmm. said. It, it's, so I'm here, I think, to share some of my observations and kind of listen to your observations and to help this guy succeed, right? <laughs> good, good. Definitely. <laughs> Michelle. Right. All right. So I'm Michelle Snyder, Senior Vice President at Hippocrates. And I did ask that question to Richard at first. Why did you invite us? Because we're not new and sexy, but I think the perspective I can provide is we are one of the truly successful companies in the mobile space. So I actually started at Hippocrates the first day in 1999. We were down in Silicon Valley. There were 10 of us in this little office, and I had a door for a desk with the you know hole for the handle that my pen kept falling through. And uh, I think the first day we got about 50 users, and we couldn't believe 50 people actually wanted to download our product. And we actually passed a million healthcare professionals. This year, we have almost 300,000 doctors that use us on an active basis. And uh, so it's been very exciting for me to see us go from day one, and we just filed our um, S1 to go public in July as well. Hey, so. Congratulations. Thank you. And, and just to put that in perspective, OK, there's about 700,000 practicing <clears throat> physicians in America. So nearly one in every two physicians is an Hippocrates customer. Patrick. Wow, that is very impressive. Uh, I like Michelle, although uh, I, I think I have even less reason to be here. Uh, I am a venture capitalist uh, at NEA, New Enterprise Associates, which is the nation's largest and most active early stage venture firm. Um, uh, I might not know why I'm here because I have to disclaim a little bit of myself uh, in that our, our shop is divided into kind of two investing teams, one that does healthcare and one that does technology. And I actually lead our uh, team investing in consumer, internet, and mobile. Um, and so I, there's a lot about healthcare that is, will be new to me, um, but uh, they're increasingly becoming, uh, we're seeing at least a lot of companies that, that skittle the line between them. Uh, I'm on the board of one such company called 23andMe. It's the world's first uh, personal uh, genomic service. Um, and, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that later on. But I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to Wilson's presentation. And just to help Patrick feel more at home, because he's not a healthcare geek like many of us here, all right? One of the things we did in our report is we identified what is the price point that a consumer would pay, not a, not a patient. Okay, a consumer would pay for a mobile health solution, okay, remote patient monitoring in this case, uh, out of their own pocket. Because what you're finding is that, again, for early adoption of these new solutions, the price point has to be something that a consumer would pay without the expectation of being reimbursed. And so we identified that generally it needs to be less than $10. It needs to be about half of a copay or so if you want someone to pay for it out of their own pocket. Right? And if you want them to buy a device, it probably needs to be less than $75.
So from a consumer perspective, that's what it is. Now, when you get to the clinical side, things get very expensive, and that could make the market even larger. But your, your perspective from this consumer buying mobile stuff is a good perspective to have when we look at the consumer side of the equation. With that, we'd actually like to turn it over to Wilson now to wow us with his uh, award-winning technology and tell us how he's going to take this to market. All right, so thank you, Chris. Oh, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Wilson Toe, and I'll be finishing my one-minute reason why I'm here today. Um, so before I begin to really talk about mobile life, um, let me provide you with some background um, and some context as to how we got started in the first place. So mobile life was founded by four students from the University of California system. Um, and Helena is actually with us here today, and she's sitting in the front row right here. Um, and the Mobile Life Project was actually part of an international technology competition, as I mentioned before, uh, the Imagine Cup, wherein students from over 100 nations actually compete to build technological innovations that help address the UN Millennium Development Goals. And so that's essentially where we came from. And the t competition is wrapped up roughly two months ago, so we're very, very, very new in the game. Um, <coughs> so our team really set out to design a project to help reduce child mortality rates throughout the world. Um, and as some of you may know, nearly 10 million children under the age of five die each year. Now, I can go on and on about the statistical figures that really come out from this, but it really concludes the same point, that there's a huge disparity that exists between uh, under five mortality in developing and in developed regions. Children um, in these regions are 13 times more likely to die. That's a pretty incredible number. And when we look at those numbers particularly, it's obvious that the problem exists. So moving on to what really causes these child mortalities uh, throughout the world. A few diseases really come to mind. And when we think about it, how do we screen for these diseases? With diabetes, we usually do a fasting blood glucose test or glucose tolerance test. With uh, pneumonia, we do chest x-rays. With sickle cell, we do blood draws. But with each of these, they're very highly effective techniques, but with each of them, they require specialized uh, medical equipment. And so many of those are found in hospitals and clinics, not really in neighborhoods of developing countries and villages of sub-Saharan Africa. And so on average, the nearest medical facility is usually 30, 40, even 50 miles away. But what, what if we could really just design something that we can do um, even in that village, a point-of-care technology? And that's essentially what mobile life is all about. And what we can see, just by taking a picture of the eye, the white part of the eye, when we take a look at those blood vessels, we can see an, even an orderly distribution of arterials, venules, and capillaries in this healthy child. Um, and with different vascular diseases, um, this changes over time. Take diabetes, for example. Uh, we, it's well understood that it's more or less an uh, increase in blood glucose in the body. And so, when you think about it, that really just means it's uh, increased blood viscosity, increased uh, thickening of the blood, more, than, more or less. So as blood's flowing through these vessels, there's a subsequent increase in hemodynamic stress along those vessel walls. And so what actually happens is the microcirculation more or less starts morphing. And so how many of you are familiar with someone who has diabetes? Minus you. <laughs> And so this is what we can see in a diabetic patient, um, a diabetic child. So as you can see, there are substantial changes in the microcirculation. Here we can see increase in tortuosity uh, in the blood vessels. We can see increase in um, vessel diameter, hemorrhaging, even microaneurysms. And as I mentioned before, different diseases have different key characteristics that are landmarked in the human microcirculation. And all, all this imaging is done on a mobile device. The technology is already out there. However, not only are we able to see images uh, in a non-invasive, in vivo, real-time, point-of-care manner on a cell phone, but we can also actually see video. So we can see actual individual blood cells, blood flow, and we can actually do hemodynamic measurements on our, on our uh, technology. Pretty interesting stuff. So when you think about it, it sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Um, using a Windows mobile device, we're actually taking pictures of the white part of the eye. So uh, we actually ask the patient to look off to the side, expose the conjunctiva, and really just take pictures. And so what that does is we're able to do all the imaging on the mobile device, 
And from there, a lot of the images and video are stored internally on the mobile device. This allows for longitudinal studies and evaluations on patients. So if we were to evaluate me, for example, um, and I had sickle cell anemia, three months from now, if given proper treatment, we can actually see the microcirculation actually revert back to normal. So we can do these longitudinal studies to see whether a treatment is working, whether the intervention is working, and we can track them in a long-term kind of study. In terms of the actual analytics, there's an Im image analysis module that helps the user measure uh, vessel diameter and tortuosity index. So these are the main uh, criteria that we use to evaluate the circulation, mainly because of the most sensitive. And so this is all done on the mobile device. However, we actually included an option where we can do the video analysis um, on a server that actually does the dynamic measurements of blood flow velocity. And so what that does is after it, does, it, it finishes on a server, it actually shoots back an SMS uh, text message back to the mobile device where the, tr uh, the user, whether it's a doctor or whether it's a volunteer, can actually see what's going on inside the body. And so we tr took great strides in designing this to make it HIPAA compliant as well, just so we can uh, kind of clear those, those hurdles in the future. So pretty simple. Um, so mobilized business plan, the kind of fruit of why everyone's here today, I guess. Um, mobilized business plan is actually operated on platforms of social entrepreneurship. By identifying a social problem and <coughs> providing solutions, specific solutions to address it, Mobile Life operates in a, not a business-oriented, nonprofit profit uh, entity that differs from traditional venture capital, which strides to maximize financial return, as well as traditional forms of philanthropic ventures that focus on ma maximizing social returns. So Mobile Life plans on using the platform of social entrepreneurship to generate long-term funding for, de for the development and distribution of its services. Therefore, the product marketing will be targeted towards nonprofit organiza organizations as opposed to enterprise, uh, enterprises and uh, traditional consumers. The alignment in uh, the objectives of Mobile Life, as well as nonprofit organizations, will really help us focus which direction we want to move into um, and really, uh, I guess, tackle those social and medical issues. And by incorporating both revenue generating practices during the second phase of our expansion, which I'll discuss later, as well as social value um, this technology really contributes, Mobile Life will be able to create a sustainable business. Um, and thereby creating a blended return on investment, both financial and social. So taking a look at the market itself, um, and the one we'll be specifically mar uh, operating in, we can probably take a guess that um, this product is aimed towards ophthalmologists and eye care professionals. However, we tried our best to really to make it as user-friendly as possible and allow trained users to do this. So all the analysis done on there, why not make the objective assessment um, using this um, published and uh, researched kind of standards um, in medical journals and really allow the computer to really see what's abnormal, what's normal. And so we really tried to take great strides in allowing, um, I guess, opening up the market. Um, and Mobilize's industry-based and competitive market are diagnostic corporations in both software and hardware markets. The, world where, the worldwide diagnostics markets is a fast and changing one, just as Chris mentioned. And a lot of the figures are mentioned in the uh, PwC report. So Mobilize's indirect competitors are, are leaders in the diagnostic equipment market, such as Roche, Siemens, Abbott, and even J&J. However, we really plan to differentiate ourselves from our competitors through the, our ability to provide non-invasive, real-time point-of-care technologies, something that's somewhat absent in the market. And so we do have two patents in the working, um, and so we're waiting to hear back from that. Um, in developing a sustainable business model, this is, I guess, where we had trouble with the most. Um, and we explored various options and have currently decided to build it around a subscription-based revenue model. Uh, mobilized revenue will be based on a variable pay per use fee and a one-time database implementation fee. However, we did explore other options, like I mentioned before, whether it's just relying on co-marketing or even just grants, um, subscription-based uh, single one-time recurring prices, um, and even support-based software pricing. And so the reason why we really stuck with the pay per use fee and one-time database account uh, kind of model is we felt that it provided an ease of implementation for our product and a quick entry into the market. And so it also allowed for diversification of future revenue growth. 
Um, so mobile life really plans to support itself, even further support itself, and build this patient capital through various funds, such as the Acumen Fund or even the Gates uh, Millennium or Gates Foundation Grand Challenges, which we applied for uh, earlier this year. And so we do have um, funding try to, to back us up, but also have a sustainable revenue model, which we wish to base our um, business on. So project roadmap. Mobile Life plans to achieve its market goals by entering, uh, employing a low-hanging fruit strategy, targeting the lowest, lowest stratum of our secondary market, the sub-Saharan country of Ethiopia. Since the competition, we've had tremendous feedback from the community uh, and through media who really got us in touch with various groups. And so we are actually working out some agreements with some medical mission groups that are enthusiastic about uh, testing the technology on the field. And in doing so, we're able to provide a mobile diagnostic tool on the field, providing evidence and example cases for cascading to our, to our market strata of target um, developing countries of, uh, poor health, uh, with poor health systems. And so furthermore, tiering the market will provide us with greater economic viability and to secure a place in the local market while um, being able to demonstrate our product um, worldwide. So eventually, Mobile Life will partner up with a larger diagnostic company, uh, corporation such as J&J or Roche, and employ the relationship of this merger to really uh, get ourselves into the competitive market in a large scale and create that mutually beneficial uh, sort of relationship by acting as a tax-exempt tax project for the larger entity to contract out. And so a larger uh, merger with the uh, larger corporation will really cushion mobile life's objectives and really sustain our growth and expansion and capabilities internationally. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening. All right, we're going to put Wilson in the hot seat right now and uh, let those of us that have many scars from having been <laughs> in his position um, start to query him about some of the challenges that, that we think a business like this could have. But before we do that, I want to ask one very simple question uh, to start with. Mechanically, how does it work? Is there a separate device that works with my smartphone, or could I just use my iPhone and take a picture of my eye right now, and <laughs> then you could look at that picture and, and, and interpret it? So actually, there's a, um, a separate lens attachment mm -hmm. that's um, actually taken out from a, base, a few basic parts from like a DVD player and like a laser pointer mouse. Um, but we do have a lens attachment that's sitting on top of it. So mechanically, it's assisted by a, a, a macro lens, essentially. OK, so from a, a mechanical perspective, you've got a device that works with another, with a mobile phone device that has a camera, mm -hmm. right? And so that device could work presumably with any camera or any smartphone that has a camera. Yeah, that's correct. Um, so um, as one of the stipulations for the Imagine Cup, which is sponsored by Microsoft, is we have to develop it on Microsoft technology. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so currently, um, the, the, app, the app is actually um, only working on Windows Mobile, and it will be working on Windows Phone 7 uh, shortly, actually. So. All right, well, that's helpful. All right. <laughs> well, why, don't, why don't we start with Patrick, because Patrick you know, listens to these sorts of things every single day. Yeah, Wilson, first of all, very great job. I can see easily why you won a national competition. It's a startling concept, um, well executed, a real need for it, and you can see the value. So congratulations, first of all. I think Thank that's you. it's outstanding what you and your fellow uh, founders have done. Um, my first question was really, Chris's question actually, was the, was the technical question, was how do you get Focus and, and I, I know you attach a different lens, but even you know in smartphones today, even you know the ones that uh, do barcode scanning, for instance, you know barcodes are made to be scanned by a pretty basic camera. Those are you know notoriously difficult to use. Um, so I got the, the kind of that micro technical question, and then a, a macro question, which is, is it actually easier or more accurate to diagnose the diseases that you've targeted in this way? Or when someone comes to, and again, I again disclaim knowledge of diagnoses here, but um, when someone comes and they have diabetes or they have sickle cell anemia, is it actually more accurate just to diagnose them in another way, or is this a convoluted way to do that? Um, and then I got questions around the, uh, the maintenance of the, of, the, of the phones, the machines, and the infrastructure. Do you think there's infrastructure in Ethiopia to 
you know, get, get all this kind of thing. I can easily see how, how it would work in this country, but that's a grab bag of kind of technical okay. questions. All right, so three questions. Mm. So. Um, so firstly, to address your, your one of three questions, um, the, um, in terms of the lens and the focus, um, that was one of the problems that we did have initially. Um, and so what we did was actually build a kind of like a headrest where patients would be able to just sit down on and really just focus on one thing. And so using a, a, an objective macro lens, we, we, we can actually maintain a focus from a certain distance. And so what we actually included to really help that was an image stabilization algorithm that kind of helps, um, helps the computer kind of focus in on everything and make sure there's not too much shakiness and whatnot. So that was one of the big uh, uh, complications we had initially, um, but it really took us probably like four months to work out mm -hmm. um, during the competition. And, so. and on average, how many attempts does it take to get a, an image that's clean? Um, usually when we do uh, uh, video, for example, we'll take probably five or six minutes worth of video. Um, oh, and wow. so, so we can So the that. patient is lying there for five or six minutes? Yes. Exactly. <coughs> and then the second part of your question... Um, is, this an, is this actually an easier or more accurate way to diagnose the diseases that you've So is this about? just cool, or is it actually better? Yeah. <laughs> that, good. Pithy, Chris, pithy. <laughs> um, I, I certainly think it's pretty cool. Um, but um, I guess we actually run, run these um, uh, uh, tests to benchmark it against current gold standards, and we actually have um, it working to about uh, a fifth of a percent in terms of accuracy in actually analyzing the um, um, blood flow velocity, for example, or even even just catching which abnormalities are present in there. So they, um, it's very, uh, I guess, uh, equivalent to uh, the gold standards now. But of course, this is just a, um, a tool to use f to supplement a diagnosis, not really to make a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So we want to, uh, at the end of the day, have the user or the doctor kind of make the diagnosis. Um, so. Now, you're using the word diagnosis, but in, in medicine, we differentiate between screening and diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So is this a screener, or is this truly diagnostic? Um, mainly just a screener, um, more than okay. anything, because it provides information for, uh, for, I guess, the user or even just the doctor to run further tests, if necessary, right. to confirm uh, whether... Um, a patient has a certain disease. So. Okay, so that, that's an important distinction in healthcare because if it's just a screener, number one, it almost never gets reimbursed. And if it does, at very low level. Uh, so, so that's part of the problem with this market. Okay. Now, if it's a screener, are there other things, and this gets to Patrick's question, are there other things that can screen, not, not the same sort of approach that you're looking at with this mic, um, you know, microvascular analysis, but are there other ways to screen that are faster, better, cheaper than what you're proposing? Um, from what I understand, based on the research that I have, there are certain technologies out there. Like, um, I believe there are some that are just a film strip where you just even just put like a blood sand, um, I guess, faster. But then we don't see what's actually happening in the body, and that's something that we provide, because mm -hmm. we can actually see how much damage is done in the body already um, due to these microcirculatory damage. Mm -hmm. so. And then one last part of Patrick's question, which was kind of the bigger galactic. You want to re-ask that, Patrick? Yeah, it was, it was aside from the device itself, um, what is necessary to support the technology in terms of a maintenance when it breaks down? Who do I call in Ethiopia to, to fix my <laughs> lens or get it replaced? And the infrastructure, you know, is, do you feel like there is the infrastructure to upload photos, to process mm -hmm. in the cloud, to store them? To, is, there that, is there all the, the, the ecosystem around... Um, the, the invention to actually make it work. Is there the mm -hmm. bandwidth that I don't even have here at Stanford University <laughs> for my iPhone to actually upload this image <laughs> in Ethiopia? You know, actually, I, I actually just read a report last week where it's, um, it was discussing the, the expansion of mobile technologies even in third world countries. And uh, even just, just like the United States, um, the citizens in Ethiopia are really quick to adapt technology so it's pretty interesting because they're actually using some of the uh, technologies there to um, do some uh, tele telemedicine and tele uh, telepathology sort of um, uh, projects over there. Mm -hmm. So the infrastructure is there in terms of um, the mobile systems, but in terms of what we want to offer is um, more along the lines of, hey, we can bring a mobile device in there, and then we can kind of adapt to what they have um, mm -hmm. based on some, uh, some of the other technologies that we have in place. But we, uh, 
it, essentially, we want to try to get it working there, and we wanted to start doing some trials actually later this summer, or upcoming summer. Okay. Now, Michelle, you've been taking lots of notes. What, what's, what are your insights? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I was thinking about, I actually have a lot of friends that work in Doctors Without Borders in Africa, and when you had, you know, the market is ophthalmologists, and they're the ones who use the product. The interesting thing in Africa is a lot of the people that provide the health care aren't doctors or nurses. They're oftentimes just lay people and people in the villages. And so that's why I thought the diagnosis screening question was interesting because do you think this is a technology that, you know, just a lay person can use because a lot of times you don't have a doctor or a health care professional there. And maybe if it's screening, it is, that is easier for somebody to use versus a diagnostic tool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely something that we struggled with initially, whether or not we wanted to just position it as a screening tool or a diagnostic tool. And um, it was kind of interesting mainly because uh, we wanted to approach it in the in an essence where it's we positioned it where it was better than nothing, better than no healthcare. Right. Um, and so we wanted to provide a system and application that anyone can use. And so we try to make it as simple as possible. We, did through um, some UI tests. We ran it through uh, a number of doctors to see what they thought of it, how they used it, and whatnot. So it was definitely, it, we put a lot of work into designing it to make it as simple as it, as it could be for anyone to use, to use it, so. Any other things, Michelle, before we move to Anand? No, go ahead. Okay. So, go ahead, whatever's on your mind, but I also want you, having just gone through the FDA process, <laughs> <laughs> to use your FDA lens to think about what challenges he would have. Now, maybe in Ethiopia there is no FDA, and so life is easy. But in this country, he'll have to deal with those people. Yeah, the, um, the honest truth is that yeah, whilst it, there is no FDA, uh, the first thing they'll ask you is, do you have FDA approval? <laughs> um, because for them, it's still a compass of you know what they consider to be quote unquote clinically valid. Uh-huh. Um, my question, so I'll come back to the FDA in a second. My question is about the value proposition. So if I think about WellDoc and I think about um, there's a bunch of apps out there that like it, like you said, it's useless if you put in a blood sugar of 58 and it says thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, at 58, you better be eating 15 grams of carbohydrates right now mm-hmm. and fast-acting carbs. Otherwise, you're going to tank, and then your, pro- you know, your probability of going into a coma rises dramatically. So you want to know not just data, but you want to know information, knowledge, and action, mm-hmm. and the closed loop that brings it back. There's a value. When you actually take the patient through that journey, and you watch it longitudinally, and you connect this information through evidence-based medicine to a physician, there's a value proposition along that way. If you can articulate what that value proposition is in outcomes that are either uh, clinical markers, uh, that are uh, risk factors reductions, or that if you can actually translate it to dollars. So, for example, can I use this, even as a screening thing, can I use it and demonstrate that when I do this, if I take a patient A who is predisposed to having this because of other lifestyle factors, maybe their blood glucose is high and things like that, I slow the onset of retinopathy, one, two. Can I actually use it for a person who is diagnosed and who has this acute issue and show that I'm either uh, 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 stunting the growth trajectory of their... So have you started to put your arms around how do you measure the value proposition and what value proposition is actually relevant to your market? What, what, if, you, if you could go to the chief medical officer of a payer, okay, or you could go to the health minister in Ethiopia, what are the three things they would want to measure? And then say, well, th- this unequivocally helps me. Mm-hmm. That's a definitely an excellent point. Um, so one of the things that we measure in our image analysis, for example, is we actually use a, an objective's uh, severity index. And so, um, <coughs> almost like those biochem- uh, bio- biomarkers that you were referring to earlier, we can actually uh, evaluate a patient with diabetes, for example, and see, um, give them a kind of a grade, saying, okay, well, we see uh, microaneurysms here, we see hemorrhaging, we see uh, tortuosity. So numbers probably add up to about nine, for example, for a diabetes patient. And if we give them treatment um, six months later, let's go, go ahead and take a picture of their eye again. Let's go take video of their eye. How much has that changed? So we actually do have an objective means of measuring how much, uh, uh, how much has changed over that six months due to that medication, due to that treatment. And then, um, like I was talking about earlier as well, we're able to do that kind of long-term, uh, longitudinal um, kind of uh, evaluation 
where we're able to see uh, pictures side by side um, about uh, how much has the diameter of this vessel changed or how much has the velocity changed in this vessel kind of thing. So we do try to position it so we have an objective way of measuring um, kind of, uh, and kind of show, show the, the user what's, what exactly is happening in the body. So, so let me just follow up with your question. And before I do that, just a reminder, the yellow cards, if you have any questions, fill them out and what, send them to the, uh, yeah, volunteers on the edges are, are collecting them. And then we'll have those. But, but Anand's question about this value proposition, I, I oftentimes suggest that a value proposition has the four C's, cost, convenience, confidence, and compensation. All right? So if you want to sell this to Ethiopia or to whomever, you've got to say, OK, here's your current cost of doing whatever you do to diagnose diabetes. And with my technology, your cost will be x minus 10% or, or something like that. Um, confidence says, and you know what? Even though it's cheaper, it's as good or better. And here's the data that suggests that it's as good or as better as the alternative. Okay? Uh, convenience says that it's easier to do. You can have lay people that have no clue about how to test this stuff use this technology because it's so easy and so convenient, or maybe even people can do it themselves. And then compensation. Uh, in healthcare, doctors, and last time I said this at a conference, people were blogging at the same time, and I got in trouble from my boss, okay? So no one blogged this, all right? Um, okay, and, and so this is really touchy. Doctors do what they're paid to do. I know I shouldn't have said it, okay? But, but doctors do what they're paid to do, all right? So if you don't have a way of having a healthcare professional use your technology and get paid to use it, it's not going to be used. I really don't care if it cures cancer, OK? So, so you've got to have that compensation part. What is somebody else, either a salesperson to sell it or a doctor to use it, what is somebody else going to get paid to take your solution to market and make it effective? So cost, convenience, confidence, and compensation. So what's your pitch to the Minister of Health in Ethiopia? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> On the spot hot seat. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we wanted to do really wasn't really to work with the Minister of Ethiopia or whatnot. It was actually just to pair, to work with nonprofit organizations. How can we equip them? So it would be more targeted towards that sort of market. And um, working with NPOs, we, we would be able to provide um, kind of test models, for example, um, where we're able to provide that clinical trial sort of uh, mindset for them to start off with. But it's something I definitely have to work on more, um, especially preparing a pitch to the minister, but um, it's something I can definitely get back to you on. So, so if, if suggestion, one suggestion. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what you have is part diagnostic, to the extent that you can show exactly what you said. Part of what you have is part kind of the screening. Part of what you have is just education, because it is the social worker in, the, in this country who's actually delivering that point of care. In many cases, sometimes if you're lucky, they're educated, and they actually yeah, sometimes know. They're sometimes they're not, the honest truth. So, it, so all of a sudden, if you take your solution and you dissect it into these you know, fundamental things, each of them has a different value proposition, but to different constituents. Mm -hmm. So as an example, we'll be launching a program uh, with the largest hospital system in India, and we brought a wireless operator to the table. And I also brought the National Skills Development Corporation, which is a prime minister funded thing that says, we want to raise the skills for social workers in the treatment of diabetes, uh, uh, malaria, da 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 da, right? So, and each of them has a pocket of money that they want to bring to the table. So all of a sudden, your value, uh, you're, 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 you're selling to different constituents, mm -hmm. but you're, you're the integrator. You're bringing all of this together. Because they have no other reason to come together. They come together on your technology. Mm -hmm. So one, one, one way out of the dilemma is, how do you do exactly what you said, but do it from different lenses, mm -hmm. to the different pieces of your solution, right? The second one, which is a it happened by accident, is the honest truth for us. Pharma. So I'm assuming that there's drugs that they would prescribe based on the outcomes that you, you know, if it's a certain, you know, uh, diameter or it's a certain, mm -hmm. you know, progression, you may want to put them on a higher dose of, right? Mm -hmm. Pharma is a great source of non-dilutive capital. <laughs> and it, and it, <laughs> OK, 
Okay, and just to make clear, it's okay to say pharma likes to make money. Yeah. Okay, you can't say doctors like to make money, but you can say pharma likes to make money. They, 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 they are they are suffering today, especially because of what's happening with generics. You know, today Merck comes up with a drug, and you know China and India have it tomorrow for one tenth the price, and and they don't respect patent law like they should. Not yet, right? Yeah. And so they're, they're forced to innovate in faster cycles and they're forced to do things differently. So they're saying, can I take a page out of the Cisco model? Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna sell a drug, a drug. I'm gonna sell a solution with mm -hmm. the drug. Uh, we did that with AstraZeneca. I can talk about it publicly and me my measures for success with asthma where they gave Simpacord away, mm -hmm. but people were switching from Advair to Simpacord because they were getting the solution that told them how to take it, track their symptomology, you know, adjust their therapy, even look at pollen counts because a cell phone gives you things like that because, mm -hmm. you know, location-based fit. Hey, you know, you're going from here to here. You might take an extra puff so you don't end up in the yard ER tonight, that kind of stuff. They pay. Mm -hmm. They pay. You. They infuse capital, non the of capital. You, it's, our, it's, it's funded R&D. Mm -hmm. So th there's another. So when you look at this, there's actually a couple of sources of things you could tap into that you may not be tapping and into. And when you look in our report, you're going to see a case study in our report from Merck Serona. And that case study does exactly what Anand's talking about, where a wireless technology that injects a drug into a patient that can be controlled remotely by a nurse that can change the injection depth of the needle and the amount that's actually injected, enable them to transform their entire business model, okay? To transform it so that they are actually delivering value, gets to Anand's point about outcomes, instead of selling drugs, okay? So this, the ability to have this technology can actually transform a pharma's business model because now they have a way of capturing the information, using the information, you know, proposing that there be more subscription or prescriptions filled, and then monitoring it so that you know whether or not people are actually on their meds. Wilson, I have a business model uh, question. You know, at NEA, we, like other venture firms, see a wide variety of, of different behaviors in, in developed nations. And one of them is that in highly price sensitive nations, you know, unless you have to, you force someone to pay for something, they're not going to pay. And so, um, especially in the apps world, or even in this country, you know, there are very few subscription mobile services. Why have you decided to go with a subscription in a developing market? Well, I think what we originally wanted to do was actually have the subscription um, be targeted towards the NPOs rather than uh, uh, the governments of the developing countries. And so when we're working with uh, NPOs, they do have a source of funding, they do have a source of grants, and that would, of course, be supported by our grants as well, so we could further kind of decrease the cost of that. And so we're not relying on a developing country to, to pay us anything. We're actually relying on uh, the World Health Organization, for example, to kind of provide us with additional funding to have, that, have uh, the device go in that direction. So. All right, I've got some questions from the audience. <coughs> um, Patrick, you're disqualified from this one because the letters <laughs> FDA are on the card. No, I know what that stands for, <laughs> I think. <laughs> what is the FDA level of understanding of the technology and concerns and hot issues and HIPAA issues? So let's kind of take each one of those, I guess, in, in turn. So. First of all, um, so to what extent does the FDA actually understand mobile health technologies? <laughs> well, so actually, I, I was in D.C. last week meeting with the Deputy Commissioner of the FDA about Hippocrates. I mean, we're in a different space. We actually work with the FDA to communicate with healthcare professionals because the FDA has all of this information that they want to get out to doctors. So you're a channel for them. We're actually a channel for the FDA to get out information because doctors aren't going to FDA.org. And Wonder they, why. They, and, <laughs> and, you know, some of the things we've talked about with the FDA, and there's actually a company, I can't remember the name of it, but they just came out with an app where healthcare professionals can now report adverse drug events, mm. and then that will get funneled to the FDA. And you know that's that's going to be an interesting area because pharma companies also have groups where they want the doctors to call the pharma companies directly mm -hmm. and report the adverse drug events, but the FDA wants that mm -hmm. information as well. And so, um, so going back to your question, we they use us more as a channel. Um, I think another area they're getting more interested in is you know with the ARA and the High Tech Act and all the money going to electronic health records, 
it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the FDA because they are trying to get um, some of those technologies um, to have to get approved through the mm -hmm. FDA. And they're not today, and that will bring a whole another layer mm -hmm. of complexity to, I think, innovation and to companies developing electronic health record products. So let me follow up with a question for you on that. Sure. Some people have suggested that because the mobile devices, the most personal devices with you all the time, you can track your performance on a drug therapy, mm -hmm. and you can send it to the FDA in real time, right. that that could actually open the door for conditional approvals. So the FDA could say, well, we could have a smaller clinical trial because if we can gather this real-time information, we're going to be able to know in real time whether or not people are having problems with the drug. Do you, do you think that is a potential benefit of this type of technology? Actually, I hadn't really thought. Since we're not on the consumer side, I haven't. You know, I, 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 I feel like um, that, that variant of participatory democratic health care really resonates uh, with, with me and with, I think, a general trend in the internet. Um, at 23andMe, we're doing exactly that. Mm -hmm. because We're trying to upend the way genome-wide association studies can be done. Um, we just published our first peer-reviewed uh, paper that really replicated many of the results of genome-wide association studies that had taken literally tens of millions of dollars and up to a decade to perform. And we did it with a database query and about a thousand bucks. And it was because, you know, in addition to having all the genotypic data, um, to date, I think over 10 million questions have been answered on the 23andMe platform. People just like me and you who have been genotyped have answered basic questions like, you know, does Tylenol work better for you? Does aspirin work better for you? Do you have curly hair or straight hair? Do you have blue eyes or green eyes? Um, do you get migraines or not? Do you have photo, um, you know, sensitivity that causes sneezing? And we've taken all of that phenotypic data and matched it against the genotypic data and formed a, the basis for something that's really revolutionary, that's community-based research. Mm -hmm. um, now, the FDA is still behind in obviously recognizing sure. that type of research, but when you, when, you have developed, when you're starting to develop a track record of incredible uh, you know, accuracy as judged by a, an FDA standard, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're really coming upon something very powerful, mm -hmm. I think, community-based participatory healthcare mm -hmm and participatory yeah. research. Yeah, Patients Like Me is another example exactly. of that same sort of thing, exactly. Yeah. Did you have another point? Well, actually, it was, it was interesting because you're talking about the community. I, I think most people don't know this about Hippocrates, but we actually work with the CDC, so another government organization where it wasn't even doctors inputting data. We just aggregated all of the doctors' lookup information. So we track hmm. every time a doctor does hmm. a lookup on a certain drug in the database. And we could track around the country, because basically when people sync their device, that data comes back to us. We could actually predict where H1N1 breakouts were going to occur <laughs> based on our lookout data. And it was information the CDC didn't even have, and we sure. were ending up sending that information, and they were marrying that information they had internally. So. It's just another way to think about data. It's not necessarily people having to input data, but if you're collecting what they're looking up on the device, you can find some very interesting uh -huh. patterns. So, so, real story. Yeah. Um, when we submitted our 510K a year ago, uh, the FDA did not have an mHealth team in place. We sat for 90 days. They're supposed to give us a response in 45 days. No response. 90 days, no response. We sat. So we said, guys, you know, are we in? Are we out? What's going on? And uh, uh, they said, listen, can you come and show us the solution? Because we have no idea what, what, what division to put this in, what to treat it as. Is it a this? Is it a that? Is it a this? You know, PMA? Is it a 510K? Is it class one, class two? We have no idea. Okay. So we went, and it started an ongoing dialogue. And they said, hey, um, so we're going to ask you about security. You know? And it wasn't just HIPAA. They wanted the data the channel to be encrypted. They wanted mm -hmm. encryption on the phone. That's all easy to do. Okay, fine. And then they're like, oh... You're talking about multiple handset models, right? All of a sudden, they hired this person in the FDA called user experience. They've never, they've never hired a user experience person in their history. And they brought this, and she, actually, she's a wonderful lady. And she said, listen, why don't you do this, this, this? And so we did. Uh, but then, you know, th uh, three months later, she said, no, no, actually, you know what? I actually need you to do a human factor study. I need you to do a human factor study because they're interested in do you induce patient risk in what they do. Do you induce patient risk by putting in wrong data or something like that? Yeah. So do you, you're giving them And why don't feedback. they do that for any other medical device? You, you know, it's, 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 they have the protocols defined out to the <laughs> nth degree of, you know, but they don't have it 
So we just hosted a summit uh, four weeks ago. Uh, several companies hosted a summit with uh, uh, Commissioner Hamburg. And actually, the F uh, FCC was part of this too, uh, Chairman Janikowski. And, and we had dinner with uh, the commissioner afterwards, and she said, listen, that she was fully aware of what we just, we just got our clearance literally three weeks, three weeks prior to that. And she says, what could we do different? What could we do? And I'm like, in, in the three minutes you've Do you really minutes, want to know? Um, the, the, re the reality is, I think all of us, the, the mobile health companies, are going out of their way to make sure that we at least research and bring in to where are the pins in the sandbox? What can I do? What can't I do? But I said, you guys need to bring in mobile engineers, software engineers, wireless architects. You need data architects, security uh, uh, architects. You need to bring in these people so that you understand that you can still fulfill patient safety, you can still fulfill all the things you want to about privacy, encryption, et cetera, data, and you can get this wealth of data that you're not getting because people are giving it to you in real time. Like, what a, you can do wonders with that, right? You could shorten clinical trials, whatnot. So I think there is, so kudos to her. She started an ongoing dialogue. Now we meet once a month, which is great. Hey, what are the things we need to do? I think they're moving towards uh, uh, acceptance. Mm -hmm. It's a, there's a certain inevitability, right? I mean, it, it's a, at some point, they can fight all they want, but you know, cell phones are cell phones and people are gonna use them in ways that they wanna use them. So the, the question is, how do you bring the two pads together? But they're, 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 they're starting to bring in the people that mm -hmm. they should and understand how they can not be viewed as a barrier to innovation, but how they can foster innovation. Now, one of the challenges that, that I've seen recently, I was on one of these blogs that I contribute to and they were talking about how the FDA decided not to approve an application that basically puts an, an image on a cell phone, so a medical image on a cell phone, uh, because the doctor might use the cell phone outside where there's too much light, and he might not be able to see the picture clearly. Okay. That's one of the use cases. Right. Yeah. That's one. So, so j j what, what if he doesn't turn it on and he can't see it at all? <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so, so take that one step further. They, they said, catalog every one of these use cases. Have a patient or a doctor use it with the lights on, lights off. Put them in the sunlight, put them out of the sunlight. Put them in wireless coverage, not on wireless coverage. But then look at, if error is induced, what's the probability of that error being induced times the severity of that uh, the, uh, effect. And that's what they consider to be risk, is the multiplication of probability of uh, occurrence and the uh, severity level. And you have to go through and you, you can't score perfect. Nobody can, because what happens if the phone's not charged? I don't know. Yeah. You know? How do you send a reminder to charge the phone? You don't. You can't, right? Well, one of the things I loved when I had my first FDA audit with my medical device company, um, we had to validate that Lotus or that Excel worked. <laughs> okay, you, you just can't say I use Excel and I use Microsoft Word to do my documents. You have to actually validate that if you put one plus one equals two, it actually works. So there is this level of inanity that goes on. All right, next question. Uh, do we see health plans willing to pay for mobile health solutions? I mean, I, I could talk about our perspective. I mean, one of uh, our sources of revenue is from the health plans, and I think it goes back to our business model. So our, our fundamental business model hasn't really changed. It's been about building the network. We have a great free application, and most users use our free application, and then monetizing that network. And so, you know, where do you get money in healthcare? You get it from pharma. Health plans is another channel. And so, you know, what we try to do with the users is ask, you know, what is the content a doctor really wants? And then who's willing to pay to send that content? As opposed, I think a, one mistake a lot of companies say is they go to the health plans and say, well, what is all the information you have and how much will you pay? And then just you know, give it to the doctor even if they don't want that. Um, but one thing the doctor said they wanted was up-to-date health plan information. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's one of our sources of revenue. So we work with you know, the Aetna's, United Healthcare's, Medicaid plans, and we host their information. And so what that information is, is if you're a doctor, your patient comes in, say they're on Aetna Healthcare, you can see which drugs are covered, which drugs are not covered, which ones are the preferred, which ones are not preferred. Can you if see the, the fee schedule as well? Um, you can see the copay, the different levels of copay. But um, not the actual fee schedule. Not the actual fee okay. schedule, because the problem is with the employers, a lot of times the 
you might have the same insurance company, but your employer negotiated mm. a different rate. Different. So it gets complex. But anyway, the doctors need this information because what happens is they write, um, you know, a prescription. You, you know, you, you go to the pharmacy to fill it. You find out it's not on plan. You're standing there. You're waiting for the pharmacist to call the doctor. They don't want to call back either. But from the health plan's perspective, they will pay us because the more doctors that prescribe the preferred versus the non-preferred or um, the generic, uh, they make more money. And so we have a lot of ROI studies that show, you know, if you can get this many doctors to prescribe the preferred versus the non-preferred, here's the ROI. And so, you know, we've shown that over the years with the health plans. And that is something they're willing to pay for. I mean, it affects their bottom line. Mm -hmm. What do you find with yours? Or is pharma companies your customer? Is the physician your customer? Is the patient your customer? Who's your customer? The enterprise. So it's the health plan. It's the self-insured employer. It's the pharmaceutical company, the home health agency, not the end user, the physician. Mm -hmm. or the. So I, I, Michelle's absolutely right. It, 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 is, it is. They absolutely will pay. So for example, if you, if you in, in our last clinical trial was with Care First, so Blue Cross Blue Shield of DC, Maryland, Virginia, Real Blues mm -hmm. Plan. Their patients, two-year trial, Measured cost savings for every single patient. Uh, measured clinical outcomes, you know, soon to be published, all that good stuff. Yeah. So they're like, give us a price. Mm -hmm. Give us one price. Because there's a price for the application software. There's a price for the data plan if the patient doesn't have, and it's a, it's a small, it's a thin application. It's 50 kilobits a month. So it's small. It's like three bucks a month. Give us a price. If they don't have a phone that's... Mm -hmm. Arguably, they, everybody has a 2G phone at least that supports the data plan, but there's still some that aren't. So give us one price. We know what we're saving. Mm -hmm. Give us that one price. We'll, you know, and, and, and they then make it available. So how they're making it available is actually some of these people are doing very innovative things. One of the plans is kidding it and giving it to doctors. They're participating doctors. Mm -hmm. And if the doctor uses, prescribes WellDoc, to a, a, a de defined acuity level patient, they get to bill at a higher rate, okay? Mm -hmm. If they get their patient's A1C, LDL, cholesterol, and blood pressure down to goal, keep in mind there's, for those three metrics in the diabetes population today, 93% of the 27 million people in the United States don't meet the recommended guideline for those three measures. So it's a huge market opportunity to get to goal. Mm -hmm. And it's actually something you can do with drugs and with the proper coaching and intervention and, if you get them to go, we'll give you a bonus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're absolutely right. They're gonna, they're, they like it because it makes their patients better. There were some altruistic reasons yeah. they went into medicine. Uh, uh, they like it because they're, they like it because we're doing the dirty work. You're doing all the data analytics. You're doing all. The, there's no code for chase a patient's logbook. They can't charge a, a CPT code for chasing a patient's logbook. And their office staff wastes so much time. Hey, make mm -hmm. sure you bring in your, I couldn't reach them. I left a mess, I've tried four times to, right? And then they said, of course, if we get some money out of it. So health plans are absolutely mm -hmm. adopting it. And I think we're, I think we're at the, yes, it's still a nascent industry, but we're at a, you know, I hate to use these tipping point type of things, but we're at a point in this evolution where, again, inevitability, right? Mm -hmm. They are going to adopt this uh, because as, so I'll, not as well docs president, as a diabetes patient, I get calls every six weeks from my disease management company. Every Friday, sixth Friday, at noon, <coughs> at home. I'm never home Fridays at noon. How are you doing with your diabetes? And they have no clue what my latest labs are. They have no clue what my lifestyle is. No clue what my daily regimen is. And they get paid 120 bucks by the health plan per, per month to manage me. And you're like, that model's not going to work. Right? Well, we actually, it's a fact that that model doesn't work. Absolutely. Right? So, <laughs> Enough said. Yeah, yeah. You know, at NEA, we're seeing a bunch of uh, really interesting companies that are, I think, an, uh, that are being reimbursed by health plans or sponsored by health plans employers that are an offshoot of preventative medicine. You know, a lot of these uh, insurers have just done their big actuarial studies that you guys know better than I will and say, you know, to you know, pay for one, uh, you know, cancer patient is equal to paying for a thousand people's health plans to get them healthier so they, so they act, um, that they don't get cancer in the first place. Um, there are, you know, companies like Healthy Wage, uh, Shape Up the Nation, Move You, uh, that are mobile, almost, uh, that are explicitly gaming dynamics uh, mm -hmm. applied to this sphere. You know, a company like Move You will say, you know, you run four, two people, peer to peer, I will challenge my friend Wilson. If you run four miles, I'll do uh, an hour of jumping jacks. And it's a silly challenge, and there's no enforcement, 
but I issued that challenge, and we both executed, and it's, it's a way of bringing social reinforcement and gaming dynamic uh, to, to mobile health. And a lot of health plans are actually sponsoring that. Mm -hmm. And the gaming dynamic issue is actually interesting because they're employing behavioral economics. Mm -hmm. Right. Because what they find is that the normal incentives that we have traditionally imposed upon people don't really work, but these behavioral economic models actually tend to be more effective than right. that. And as an onset, I mean, they're seeing real outcomes from it, mm -hmm. real cost and health outcomes from behaviors like that. Yeah. All right, another question. This one's to you, Wilson. All right, you ready? Uh, do you anticipate pushback from the diagnostic companies whom you are disintermediating? They are losing money to you. So well, one of the, the measures of whether or not you really have a good idea is how many people don't like you. <laughs> All right? so, so the more disruptive your solution, the more enemies you create. Okay. Now the good news is if you believe uh, Clayton Christensen's work on the innovator's dilemma, is that they're actually ignore you until it's too late, and then they don't like you. Uh, but who actually loses if you win? Um, when we're doing a lot of our market research studies, actually, um, I, like, like I mentioned before, a lot of it was in um, uh, little small subdivisions of uh, Roche or J&J. &J. And a lot of them were actually um, part of um, a lot of diabetes studies, actually, or early, early detection of diabetes. And so, uh, I guess if, if we do, if we were to be successful in this sort of uh, venture, um, like we we actually hope to more or less team up with them, like I mentioned before, as part of our exit strategy. Um, we want to, uh, I guess, build upon that altruism that um, that we're all kind of aiming for. It's like how how do we re reduce child mortality? You know, so we're not actually looking to make enemies. I guess more or less. But let's look at the big vision, right? So, so your vision is let's go to sub-Saharan, let's go to Ethiopia, kind of test the case, see if it works. Let's go to other poor countries, because quite frankly, that the U.S. isn't going to adopt your technology anytime soon, mm -hmm. right? But, but you're experimenting in these other markets. You're finding what works, and all of a sudden, you're finding that you know what we've got a solution now that will work in the United States. Okay? And it will work at a price point that the payers are now going to jump on board and they're going to start using it. So once it comes back here after having been incubated, accelerated in those markets, okay, and then you bring it back here to scale it, who loses back here? That's definitely a good question. Um, hmm. Who loses? I, I honestly feel that it, it's more along the lines of kind of just just mobile health companies in general, mainly because we're able to kind of push the boundaries forward in those diagnostic um, companies. But at the same time, like, it really helps to really push the technology forward more than anything. And so there's not any big winners or losers in terms of, um, I guess, technology and what we're really trying to do with it. But in terms of, I guess, monetary, like, it's really just our competitors, um, and both direct and indirect competitors. And so it, just some of the ones that I named off um, with their specific uh, projects that are going on in terms of mobile, mobile uh, early intervention tools and screening. Okay, my model of innovation suggests that you've got to create some tension to create innovation. So the, the, the beginning of innovation is failure. And then failure that turns to pain, then pain turns to tension, then tension turns to innovation, and innovation turns to growth. And that's the cycle of innovation. So. Unless you're creating some tension in the system, you probably aren't creating an innovation that's going to be rapidly adopted. And so I think you've got to think about what sort of tension is going to be created in the system as a result of your innovation coming to market. Because that tension is an energy source. And that energy source is what, going to be what powers you uh, to move forward and to actually create a, a, a broadly adopted uh, innovation. Yep. So we got four minutes. Okay, got another question here. Um, uh, some would like to hear a little bit more about the well doc and the Hippocrates story. So could you each do a a one minute soliloquy of uh, in in song? In song. <laughs> in fact, I saw this YouTube video the other day of these uh, Irish dancers, you know the dancers they do? Well, they were actually doing it at a table with their hands like this. So if you could actually do it choreographed together <laughs> with Anand and Michelle, that would be, that would be great. Yeah. Can we go first? Please. 
All right, so um, actually Apocrypheus was founded in 1999 by two GSB graduates. It was actually their class project. And the initial idea actually was not in healthcare. It was to use Palm Pilots at the Giants games to uh, <laughs> report scores and things like that. It's so kind of a wellness solution. It could be a wellness It's so solution. GSB. <laughs> um, I actually went and did market research. It's... Giant Stadium and it didn't work out. But one of the founders was actually a doctor and he started thinking about healthcare. And, you know, when I started in 1999, there was this perception that doctors were technophobic. But what we found was that they're not, you have, the difference is are you technophobic or are you just not using technology because it's not solving a pain point or fulfilling a need you have? And that's what we found because what, what we found with doctors was that. If it's easy to use, if it fits into their workflow, and the fact that it's mobile and they're moving around, you know, they will use the technology. And so we came up with our free product in 1999, um, and that's the whole goal is still most users use the free product, but then we also came out with a subscription product in 2004. And that's been interesting for our company to balance, you know, when I'm in charge of marketing, on the one hand, everyone can use the free product and I'm happy because we make money from pharma companies who pay to access health plans, et cetera. But on the other hand, I'd also like them to buy our product and you know, get the subscription. And so um, we came up with a subscription product. Things were going well. It was interesting. I would say probably about you know, 2006, 2007, 2008, there was kind of a flattening of the mobile market and it kind of stagnated at about 50% of doctors using a mobile device. And then really what has kind of been the resurgence was the iPhone coming out, right? And so between 2007 and now, the adoption of mobile devices among healthcare professionals has gone from 50% to near 80%. And my guess is, you know, it'll be, you know, 90% plus in the coming up years. And the real difference from us has been looking at our business model. In the past, we had to get doctor, we had to um, get them to buy a device so that was actually more of the sale, is you have to get a device and then use us. Today, um, most doctors have a device, so the challenge is a little different. It's now that there's a lot of healthcare apps, and how do we make sure they think of Hippocrates when they already have a device? Um, so let's see, going back to our business model. So like I said before, um, you know, I think in the S1, last year our revenues were about $90 million. Most of that comes from pharma companies. Um, that's the majority. We also health plans. We have the biggest market research business in the country um, in terms of doctor panel. So one thing we thought about is doctors are coming in for free, but doctors also want to make money. So when they come in, they can sign up to be in our market research panel, and that's been a great revenue generator for us. So we're basically the middleman between the pharma company or whoever else wants to survey doctors. And the doctors get paid, so it's a nice win-win. They get to use our product for free. They can also do market research and make money as well. Great, great. Anand. It's, and my wife's a dermatologist, and she uses the oh, okay. subscription model. She loves it. Um, so it was founded by an endocrinologist uh, back in 2005 at the Joslin Center, University of Maryland. Uh, and there was a couple of aha moments. One, on the patient side, it's a complex disease. You got to manage all these different variables: your 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 carbohydrates, your insulin, your medicine, your exercise, sleep, smoking, all the things that affect your diabetes wellness. And there's this little thing called life that tends to get in the way every now and then, right? Um, on the physician side, it was equally a challenge. So a patient sees a good patient sees a doctor four times a year for a three-minute office visit. Uh, and, you know, what's a doctor going to do? I'm a nerd. I graph everything and bring it into my doctor. What's he going to do? Look, the human eye can't do that kind of pattern recognition in a short visit. As a result of that, there's this horrible thing called clinical inertia. Doctors on average, primary care, who see 90 plus percent of the chronic disease patients, diabetes, asthma, CHF, et cetera, they wait 12 to 14 months before they add a second drug or titrated drug in a patient's regimen. In the case of insulin initiation, it's four to six years of insulin, a, a delay before they initiate insulin. And of course, in that four to six years, neuropathy, retinopathy, kidney f damage, heart damage, all this bad stuff's happening, right? And the aha moment was that everybody who came in, regardless of their age, socioeconomic status, race, like education, had a cell phone. And they weren't afraid to use it. Hold on, doc, I need to take this call. Um, <laughs> so we looked around, uh, but what we saw was we saw technology for technology's sakes. Look, I can take a Bluetooth thing and put it <coughs> on a blood glucose meter, and I can beam the data to my cell phone, and poof, it goes to a, and I can graph and see how bad I'm doing. Um, it doesn't improve outcomes and it didn't reduce costs. Now you have the cost of the technology. So we did three things. We put a piece of software on a patient's cell phone that gave them their testing reminders, coaching, medication reminders, actual clinical algorithms to correct their sugars. If they're high, how to correct them, low, how to correct them. So it was actually doctor in their pocket. 
The second thing is we stood back and watched, why is it that Anand's waking up for the third time in a 10-day period hypoglycemic? Or why is he taking half the amount of Bayeda that his doctors recommended? So there was a whole bunch of, at that time it was a simple rules engine, today it's a complex, it's got some 15,000 uh, complex rules, multivariate rules. And then the last thing was, could you take three months of data, analyze it against evidence-based medicine and give the doctor a one-page report, if they want it by fax grade, if they want it in a portal grade, that said, hey doc, here's where they were, here's where they are, here's what's changed, this is what you ought to do against evidence-based medicine, okay? But you're the expert, do what you think is right for your patient. <laughs> when, we, when we did that, we dropped A1C by two points in 90 days. Again, uh, I used a good drug, drops it by a half a point, which is, uh, um, so we knew we were onto something. So we founded a company back in 2006, uh, 70 employees today, uh, angel investment, cash flow positive, uh, diabetes, asthma, uh, soon to be oncology, congestive heart failure, uh, uh, now beyond, we got FDA clearance, uh, which is wonderful. The only cell phone interven interventional solution that the FDA has recognized. Uh, launching commercial programs in Canada, Israel, Saudi Arabia, India. Um, getting calls from people like the NHS saying, we want to do this. We want to help you commercialize in the UK. And what we see is this, here's a technology that knows no boundaries. Think about it. It's more pervasive than any other technology in the world. The, 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 I always say the rickshaw driver in Mumbai who has diabetes, who doesn't have a place to sleep, has a bloody Nokia 6600 and he uses it. <laughs> so here's, here's something that breaks socioeconomic boundaries, it breaks language boundaries, it breaks geography boundaries, and it, it provides access in a configurable, it's not a one size fits all. You can configure it at the plan level, the provider level, and the patient level. So it's, mm -hmm. And of course it's engaging because that's what they use to run their lives these days. So I was interviewed by The Economist magazine a few months ago, and they asked what I thought of mobile health. And I said, for exactly the reasons that Anand just enumerated, that this is going to revolutionize medicine more than any other technology we've ever had. And the reason is a couplefold. One is that information data in healthcare is doubling every nine months. Okay? It's twice Moore's Law. And with all this information now, we don't have the ability yet to make sense of most of it, okay? But as we do, as Anand's doing, starting to make sense of it with algorithms and, and tools, uh, we'll be able to actually now transform the way we practice medicine. And all of this information now is being brought to us in the most personal form of any technology ever in the world, and that is in the palm of our hand. And as the information gets into the palm of the patient's hands and the palm of the doctor's hand, now it starts to transform the way we practice medicine at a personal level as well as how we practice medicine at a clinical level. And so with that, we're going to see this pervasive change in the practice of medicine. An interesting statistic is that actually the, the numbers that I saw just last week, Michelle, is that 90% of all clinicians have a smartphone. Half of those are iPhones, by the way. Um, <coughs> half of those are iPhones. And that... For the first time, CIOs cannot keep up with the demands of the clinicians for information technology. Up until this point, before smartphone devices, CIOs were pushing against the doctor's will them to adopt information technology because every single information technology solution was disruptive to the physician's workflow. Now doctors are buying these devices on their own nickel and demanding their CIOs come up with the cool apps that they have at Mount Sinai in Canada or Good Shepherd in Texas or Stanford Medical School or wherever so that they can practice medicine in a way that actually improves outcomes and decreases the cost and improves the workflow. So that's why we're also excited about this technology. You've heard some very interesting real business models that really make money. You've got Wilson here, who's got to figure out how to make money. He's not quite there yet, but he's working on it. He's got a cool technology. And so we were just very pleased to be able to share this with you, and I'll turn the time over to you now.